There is a song over a thousand years old that is still traditionally sung by pilgrims travelling on the ancient route through France and across Spain to Santiago de Compostela. Although I knew of the chorus, Ultrea, which means onward, I've only learned the translation of the rest of it since coming back from our own pilgrimage there a couple of years ago. It begins, every morning we take the way, every morning we go farther. Day after day the route calls us. Onward, onward and upward. God assist us. Way of earth and way of faith, it's the way of all the Santiago pilgrims. And over there at the end of the continent, Santiago waits for us. Onward, onward. I know I've been reading a lot of books about pilgrimage recently and particularly about the many routes to Santiago and I've been re reliving a lot of memories of my own experiences so perhaps it's no surprise that this song came to mind when I was reading this Bible passage from Paul's letter to the Christians in Philippi. Paul speaks of himself as leaning into the future, of straining forwards and onwards in response to the way in which Jesus has invaded and taken over his life of pressing on to the goal. Often we might think about our life of faith as a pilgrimage or journey, aware that we're called to keep moving onwards, keep moving forwards to draw nearer to our destination, yet that we will not arrive there fully in this lifetime. When I first set out on my own pilgrimage to Santiago, I had a degree of self-confidence about the whole thing. I'd got the right kind of gear. I hadn't packed too much stuff. I'm generally a fit and active person and although I hadn't done much in the way of long distance hiking, I was sure that I was more than capable of getting through the 500 miles without feeling too much physical strain. I thought that time spent in exercise classes and at the gym several times a week, as well as always choosing to walk rather than drive if possible, and rarely sitting down at home, would all get me off to an excellent start. Well, they say pride goes before a fall and in this case it certainly did. I'd only walked for one day, and that was only 25 kilometres, or just over 15 miles, when I realised that all that I'd been relying on meant nothing. The day was a hard slog, mainly through rain and snow, along woodland trails that were steep and muddy, and I genuinely thought I was going to die. With a lot of prayer and a huge amount of encouragement from Graham, I managed to plod on, albeit slowly, as I stopped every few paces. And finally, we reached our hostel for the night. As I lay in bed in a room with 200 other pilgrims, I knew that all confidence in my own abilities had gone. I knew that if I was going to make it through another 485 miles, it wouldn't be because I had the resources myself. I turned to God, asking for strength and everything else I needed to get through. I knew that I was utterly weak on my own. At the start of this Bible passage, Paul is responding to a group of Christians who are so proud of their Jewish heritage that they're insisting on non-Jewish Christians being circumcised. Paul tells them that he's got even more reason to be proud of his pedigree and accomplishments than they have. He writes about the privileges of his birth and upbringing and the things he did by choice to prove his zeal, his fanaticism in persecuting the church, his fastidiousness in keeping the law. He was the model Jew, accomplished and devout. He was deeply involved and active in his tradition, and he was passionate in defending it. But in a dramatic turn, he says, Whatever gains I used to think I have, I've come to see them as losses because of Christ. He doesn't depict his call or conversion as the solution to some moral, emotional or spiritual crisis, but actually it causes him a problem. Because of Jesus, all the things he thought he'd achieved are worthless. Knowing Jesus has led to a radical transformation in Paul's values. In verse 8, many translations use the word rubbish to describe how Paul views his accomplishments. But actually the Greek word is much stronger. I will politely translate it here as dung. Paul literally says that even the best he's achieved is fit only for flushing down the toilet. For Paul, knowing Christ means living in him, having that connection with Jesus and with all believers in the body of Christ. And it also means that he has to lay aside any righteousness, any benefits that he thinks he has through his own efforts. And instead, he has to trust only in the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ. Paul can't think, 
speak or act as if his work is his alone. And he can't behave as if all his pious activity has given him some kind of good standing before God. Paul knows that now he can only seek God's righteousness that he has found without merit in Jesus. Paul writes that there's already been a massive change in his life, but he knows that he hasn't yet reached the goal. And there are two parts to this goal. Being with Christ after death and spiritual maturity in this life. To go back to my Camino analogy, ultimately my destination was Santiago de Compostela. Every day that I walked took me nearer to that city. At any point I could have decided that I'd had enough walking and I could have jumped on a bus or a train and arrived in that city within hours. But I also knew that the final destination was not the whole thing. The way I walked each day, the things I had the opportunity to learn about myself and God along the way, the moments to serve and be served by other pilgrims, the slowing down and slimming down, the simplicity of basic necessities and the reliance and trust in God for all that I needed. These were all important too. And in fact, in my memories, these all have greater prominence than my arrival in Santiago at the Cathedral of St. James. How I walked the walk, what kind of pilgrim I was, these were important too. I was particularly challenged by one priest who preached at a pilgrim mass we went to along the way, who challenged us about our attitudes. What kind of pilgrims were we? What happened when we met pilgrims who annoyed us or who we disagreed with? What happened when something went wrong with the accommodation or when we couldn't find food or when other pilgrims had used up all the hot water before we got there? Could we find love and grace for each other even in the midst of all these things? He said that if we couldn't find that love and grace, then perhaps our pilgrimage wasn't worth much at all. It was a really sobering and challenging thought. So for Paul and for us, there is a striving to the goal of complete union with Christ in death, which is only possible through our striving to become like Christ in our living. The journey prepares us and shapes us and fits us for our ultimate destination. And Paul writes that he continues to strive for both parts of his goal because he has been overtaken by Jesus. The translation that I'm using is really rather mild in verse 12. It says, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. But literally, Paul has been seized, captured, taken hostage or overtaken by Jesus. Paul didn't initiate the relationship or do anything to earn it. And because Paul has been captured or seized by Christ, and Paul sees this as a gift of grace, because of this he presses onwards for the goal, to become like Christ and to be with Christ. Often we portray the gospel as the answer to the problems in people's lives, but Paul understands the gospel to be the opposite. It gives him no answers to his problems, but instead it disturbs his answers and his certainties and it sends him on a lifelong journey in search of a new solution. In fact, it thrusts a new understanding on him that requires a radical reassessment of his past, present and future, his values and priorities. So perhaps this passage holds a warning for us alongside an encouragement. Beware when you're so sure of yourself and what you're doing. Beware when you think you've got it all worked out. Beware when you're tempted to dwell on all the good things you think you're doing for God or to sit back and rest on your spiritual pedigree. Jesus calls us to join him on this uncomfortable journey or perhaps as Paul would have it, Jesus grabs us. Either way you want to see it, the journey is a gift of grace. The journey becomes the place of encounter with Jesus and fellow pilgrims we meet along the way. The journey becomes the place of refining and transformation as we gradually learn to let go of our certainties and to trust more in the one whose steps we follow. The journey becomes the place of growth where we discover more about ourselves and what we can do in God's strength. The journey becomes a path of freedom as we daily discover that although it may be hard or treacherous or seem beyond our capabilities, we would choose no other way. So come on, pilgrims, let's recognise that this is who we are and let's support each other 
as every day we choose once again to put on our walking boots, pick up our rucksacks and follow Jesus, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Ultrea peregrinos, onwards pilgrims, onwards.